Hi, and welcome back to my YouTube channel on this Easter holiday period. Um, Good Friday here in Adelaide today. So happy Easter to all of you, and please stay safe on the roads and wherever else you might be. I, I'd just like to share today, I'm not going to, um, it's not going to be a, a video as such, but um, an audio podcast following on from this little talk here. Um, of course, when we think about Easter, it's the... Uh, amazing sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for all of us and uh, we we think of what he did for us as a great hope the Christian hope many years ago when I first became a Christian um, we were uh, very enthusiastic about our, our faith my wife and I and we were meeting with a group of young people who were newly married we didn't have any kids and uh, we used to have regular get-togethers and all that sort of stuff in fact, even to this day, more than 50 years later, uh, some of those members in that group still meet, which is wonderful. However, very early in the piece, we were shocked that one of our numbers, who was only a young man in his early 30s, had had cancer for a couple of years, and he suddenly died one day uh, at the age of 32. <laughs> Excuse me. It really um, upset us and rocked us a bit, uh, not to say the effect it had on his young wife at the time. Anyway, uh, a couple of days after he died, we were having, I don't know whether it's a funeral or the actual church service that we had on the Sunday following his death. But anyway, we had a service at our church, which was packed with people. And um, his uh, parents were there and his wife was there and all of us uh, friends of his were there. And, and the church was packed to the rafters and it was a fairly big church. And uh, I remember the pastor started off saying, well, what do we do in times like this? We sing. And I've never heard such beautiful hymn singing uh, that started off that service. But the minister, Frank Hunting, gave a wonderful message on what the Christian hope is all about. And I had an audio tape of it, I still do. And that's what I want to share as a podcast on this today. At this Easter time in 2023, we could all do with some hope, couldn't we? So uh, I hope you enjoy this and you find that it's, it's very helpful for you. And uh, I'm sure it will be for Christians. It, it may be something that starts something for people who are not yet Christians. So thanks for watching. Like if you like, subscribe if you wish, and I'll see you next time. More inadequate, more unable to express the deep feelings that are in my heart, more unable to say the things that I feel and want to say, that when I'm called upon to express to those who have passed through the experience that Velda and the Beards and the Paddock family have passed through over the past days. My feelings are always away and beyond what my words can say. And I'm never so conscious of having been so inadequate as when I try to say the things that are very much in my heart. When some dear one has been taken to be with our wonderful Saviour, and I know the loss and I know just what those folk have, are passing through. And I guess you all feel that way. There are deep things in your heart that you'd love to be able to express in adequate words and those words just don't come. But there is one thing that I've learned over the years that is far more important than the words that any one of us may say, however gifted we may be in expressing how we feel. And I've noted this down through the years and it's been something that is very marvellous and very wonderful. And it's this, that as in a family like ours, 
when one of our family has been passing through this experience, we begin to feel and our thoughts and our love is constantly directed to them and going out to them. And we, we begin to pray for them and it's in that that a very marvellous thing begins to happen. Because of our praying, because of the love that is flowing from us to them, they, and they've expressed it over and over down through the years, in his own marvellous way, God lifts and God sustains. And these folk become conscious of something they cannot give any explanation to. They become conscious of the love of God. They become conscious of a strange peace and a wonderful strength. And they are lifted above the grief and the sorrow and the loss. And God, through his wonderful Holy Spirit, begins and carries through one of the tenderest and most wonderful of all his comforting ministries. And all of this in a time when our need is greatest. I wanted this morning, very briefly, to once again remind you that it is quite impossible for those of us who are Christians to sorrow as those who have no hope. We know that Roger is with our Saviour. For him, it is glory. For him, it is wonderful beyond words. For him, a grim battle is over and it has been crowned with something that is infinitely better than anything this world can give. For he is with Christ which is far better, infinitely better. That marvellous chapter, that amazing chapter, that really came out of Christians, believe it or not, being totally on the wrong road. And there are times when people like you and I who love Jesus, who are his children, when we get hold of something that is totally wrong, couldn't be further from the truth, and these Christians, way back there in Corinth, had done just that. Some of them not all of them by a long shot, but some of them, and I wonder if they regarded themselves as advanced thinkers. <laughs> you couldn't believe the nonsense that gets about because somebody begins to think of himself as an advanced Christian thinker. Well, some of them had come up with the Marvellous thought, I suppose, they felt that there is no resurrection from the dead. And that's what they were saying. And this came to the Apostle Paul. And he heard that some of them were saying that, that there is no resurrection from the dead. 
and they're saying that these poor, misguided Christians, totally and hopelessly wrong, were the cause of us having one of the greatest chapters in all of the New Testament. This marvellous 15th chapter of Corinthians, which I urge you to read again as you go home, to refresh your faith, and if you have any ideas that aren't quite right, to set them right in what is said here. And you will remember, if you have any knowledge of the chapter, that Paul says, Now how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? Do you really know what you are implying when you say that? Do you really know what the consequences of what you are saying are? Well, I suppose they were like lots of Christians today and they shrugged their shoulders, they hadn't thought much about it, they'd come up with this brilliant sort of an idea that they had. And then he told them. He said, you know what you're really saying? What you're really saying is that Jesus never rose from the dead. That's what you're really saying when you say there is no resurrection, then you are in fact really saying that Jesus never rose from the dead. Then comes a magnificent statement. But he did rise. There is no shadow of doubt about that and he's already given them some proof at the beginning of the chapter on that score. But Jesus did rise and because God raised him we too shall live and be raised. And I can't say that without saying I was listening for somebody here to say it Hallelujah! That's wonderful. It's the biggest and most marvellous and wonderful thing I have and what I think you have. This knowledge that because Jesus rose from the dead you too shall rise. You need never die. Now that's the first thing that he says. Then he goes on because I suppose he came to know that there were all sorts of questions being asked and people do ask questions on this subject. He goes on, he says this, but some will ask, how are the dead raised? People today and people in the time of uh, the Apostle have a habit, I wonder if you're among them, that when they don't understand something, they say it cannot be true. And you know the nonsense that we talk about, if I can't see it, I won't believe it. Did you ever hear anything so stupid as that? And yet there are lots of people I have met and known of who say they won't believe in God because they've never seen him. They won't believe in Jesus because they've never seen him. And they go on with this sort of nonsense which is utter rubbish and stupidity and because they don't understand some things, they wipe it. They don't believe. Now I wonder if there were some Christians in Corinth who were doing just that because they did not understand 
what the body would be in the resurrection of those Christians whom God would raise. Well, Paul goes on. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? And then he thinks not much of that question for he says, you foolish man, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body which is to be. The seed that you put into the ground doesn't come up a whole lot of little seeds, does it? It comes up a plant with a stem and leaves and flowers or bearing fruit or vegetable. It comes up something different. But to become something different, it has to die and it does in the ground and out of that death comes life. Marvellous life, wonderful life, unlike anything that was put in the ground. And so he goes on and he says, have a look at your own experience. Why? There are all kinds of bodies and you know of them. There's the moon and the stars and they're one kind of body. There is, you know them, animals, and they have a kind of body. There are fish and they have a kind of body that is theirs. There is the human body and it's different from the others. And then he makes a wonderful point. And he says this, So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown, what dies, is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It doesn't share in this perishable body. It won't be like that at all. That's what he's saying. It is sown in dishonour. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. Quite different. And that's the marvellous thing that every Christian has to look forward to. That we are going to receive in the resurrection a spiritual body like I believe unto that of our Lord and Saviour Jesus. For those of you sitting here this morning with real faith in Jesus believing that he died for you that when he was upon the cross he was bearing your sins that when he died he was dying in your place that when God raised him from the dead he was assuring you that you too would share in that resurrection when God did that he was making it very clear that for us there is no death, only a transition, only a changing over. I remember travelling years ago to Sydney from Melbourne and always we had to get out of the Melbourne train, the Victorian train at Albury and cross over into the New South Wales train. And it always seemed to me that death was just like that. Getting out of the one train, going into the next to continue the journey that was planned and mapped out for you. There is one thing that I would like to say. And it comes in the 50th verse. And I think this is a very, very important word 
to our day and our generation. I am amazed. If it weren't something that I was constantly running into, I couldn't believe that intelligent people such as we are supposed to be could be so indifferent, so haphazard, so uninterested, and we are supposed to be intelligent people, that we could be so, you know, haphazard about this business of the life that is to come. There seems to me to be a great veil over the minds of most of the people in this country. And the veil seems to cut them off and they're all living as though this is the only life. And they seem to be quite incapable of sitting down and just thinking what is true. I am mortal, I shall die, then what? Now if they ever do, the next thing that they do seems to me to be just as incredibly naive or unrealistic. If they do any thinking in this way, then they come up with the silliest answers that ever you could dream of. I'll tell you how silly they can be. They can say, they can have a look at me. You see, they happen to know me, some of these people. And they look at Frank Hunting and they know he's a Christian. They know he always goes to church. And they think, oh, yeah, well, he's very sure he's going to get to heaven. And they run their critical eye over me. And they say, well, he doesn't do too good in that area of his living and he doesn't do too good in that area. He seems to be a very ordinary bloke around the place, no different from me. And I'm surely as good as he is. Well, if he's going to get to heaven, then I must be going to get there too. Now, could you think of anything that's more stupid than that kind of reasoning? Could you? It's unbelievable that intelligent people in this day think that they're going to be accepted by God because they think they happen to be as good as you. I tell you, if they were a thousand times better than you are, they wouldn't make it. Not in a million years would they begin even to make it. It isn't our goodness or what we are or what we aren't that's going to get us there at all. We've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, we've all failed utterly, entirely, completely to meet his standards, not ours. And we're only saved. We only have one hope of salvation. Any one of us, whoever we be, in making Jesus our Lord and our Saviour. And that's where this marvellous chapter begins. Now I would remind you, brethren, he says in what terms I preach to you. Preach to you the gospel, the good news which you received, in which you stand, by which you are saved. Would you listen to this? This is the only hope any man, any woman has of salvation. So, might be a wise thing, don't you think, to listen carefully to what is said? Well, here it is. For I delivered to you as of first importance, and I want to say a little word about that later, what I also received, that Christ 
died for our sins. He died for my sins. Are you absolutely sure and certain about that? That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Are you sure about that? Let me ask the next question. And only you can give the answer. Do you know yourself to be a sinner? And I'm not rubbing it in. I'm not saying you're an evil man. I'm not saying that you're the worst fellow in the whole of Adelaide. Look, you may be outstripping me in the way you live, hands down. That could be. But I'm not talking about whether you're good or bad or where we are. I'm talking about what your relationship is to Jesus. Have you made him your own personal saviour? For one day, soon or late, you and I will all pass through the veil that Roger has passed through. And in that day, in that moment, the only thing that will really matter will be whether you and I, in the time and with the opportunities that God has given us, with those opportunities, we have received his Son, who is the only Saviour. How can we, how can we sorrow for someone we love dearly in this place? How can we sorrow for Roger, who is now with his Lord? Because that was his faith. If there was one thing he was clear about, it was this, that Jesus died for him, rose for him, and that Jesus was his saviour. I want this morning, I've known that one, I've, I've realised that as a young man, that there was nothing in all this world so important, and there were many important things, I'm not denying that. And I don't know how a ragtag like me got hold of this truth, but I got hold of it. And I got hold of it as a young man. That there is nothing in this life so important as to be ready to meet God when the time comes. There is nothing that matters more than that. That all else, however important it may be, piles into insignificance. That to have a saviour is the most important thing any and every man has in this life. Now I know that that's been thrown out of focus. I know that people don't want to look at that. I know they don't want to think about it. But that doesn't alter it. And in some ways, you and I can congratulate, can congratulate Roger. He has gone to meet that wonderful Lord. Be with him, which is far, far better. I make this appeal. Sometimes we're more ready to think than at other times. Sometimes we're more ready to face ourselves than at other times. Sometimes we hear the gospel and it's coming to us at a time when the, the whole ball of life is at our feet and we pay scant attention to it. We see no need of it, we feel no need of it and we pass it by. And then a dear one is taken, a wonderful friend 
leaves us from this life. And we're ready to think. And we're ready to apply these things to ourselves. We're ready to look at the great truths that God wants us to deal with and face and give an answer to. And I'm wondering if there's anybody here this morning for whom that has happened. If you're a Christian, we've already been reminded of this. What are you making of your life? What's the donation you're putting into this world, this life, the people around you? What are you doing with it? And if you're not a Christian yet, if you haven't received Jesus, is God speaking to you through Roger at this moment of your need to receive the Saviour? You may like to make some sort of public expression of that, I wouldn't know. But if you would, whoever you may be, if you'd like to receive Jesus as your Saviour, you walk to the front and we'll ask you if you are receiving him as your Lord and Saviour. If you want to consecrate your life, you really mean to do that, then you may do that too. Our hymn with which we close is 457, 457.